Coming late in the Second World War, the A-26 employed phenomenal firepower, armed to the teeth with an array of machine guns and cannon. The Invader was an awesome ground attack aircraft. Although it saw limited action in World War II, the A-26's ruggedness and versatility kept it in the frontline service in both Korea and Vietnam. In September 1944, Allied forces in Europe started flying missions in a new light bomber. This was the twin-engine A-26, fast, heavily armed, and loaded with a 4,000-pounds bomb. The manufacturer, Douglas, had christened it the Invader. Twenty-five years later, Invaders were still in service and in combat. The last U.S. Invader mission were flown in Vietnam in November 1969. No other American combat aircraft can match this record for long life. Of course, an airplane doesn't stay in combat service as long as the Invader unless it's truly remarkable. The A-26 was built as an attack type, though it shared characteristics with several American light bombers. It outlived the classification of attack aircraft, which was abandoned by the U.S. Air Force and became the B-26. Subsequently, however, a change in political climate saw it redesignated the A-26 again. The Invader was used by many countries. As late as 1961, they were still flying in the air forces of 21 nations. During the Bay of Pigs, A-26s were flown by both Castro's forces and the CIA-backed exiles. The French flew them at Dien Bien Phu and in Algeria. They operated in the Congo, in Bifra, in Korea, and dozens of other conflicts. They had fought in more wars than any other type of aircraft at the time. Invaders were so successful that special efforts were made to keep them on hand. When the original aircraft began to experience fatigue, the United States Air Force had 41 of the airframes completely rebuilt. The job they did was so essential that the Air Force eventually had to buy A-7 Corsair IIs to replace them. The A-26 was not a glamorous fighter or strategic bomber, and is perhaps not as well known as its history warrants. However, it not only made its marks in the record books, but also in the textbooks on close ground support in counterinsurgency air operations. The history of aerial bombing starts with the activity that falls under the modern close support umbrella. World War I planes rapidly went from being unarmed scouts to carrying guns and grenades. Within months of the first grenade attacks, aerial bombs were being developed. Simultaneously, divisions and aircraft functions were seeing the first development of specialized fighters and bombers. However, at that time, a large part of the sophistication of bombing was getting the bomb out of the cockpit and dropping it without hitting the plane. What happened below was random and largely ineffectual. By the end of the war, there were clans on both sides to build large bombers. 
enthusiastic air combat planners had quickly come to a vision of a future dominated by air power, where strategic aims would be accomplished by the use of long-range bombers. More pragmatic army planners had a vision of close ground attack support aircraft dominating a battlefield, where strategic aims were accomplished by the traditional method of occupying territory. In varying ways, both camps were right. By the eve of the Second World War, the division of aircraft had progressed to subdivisions. Bombers had been compartmentalized into tactical and strategic roles. There were small and large bombers. Some of the ground attack work was performed by fighters and the rest by specialized attack planes and light bombers. This spread of involvement in close battlefield support and interdiction made the designation of attack planes fairly irrelevant. And after the war, the division was dropped by the Air Force. Underlying the artificiality of the attack and bomber divisions is the fact that the planes most similar in size and capability to the A-26 were light bombers, the North American B-25 and the Martin B-26. The B-25 Mitchell was the slowest of three and carried the lightest bomb load. It was also the earliest design of the three and was a more conservative project. The pilots loved its handling qualities. Both the B-25 and the B-26 Marauder were pre-war designs and were based on theoretical projections of what war would be like rather than on actual war experience. The Marauder reflected the Martian concept of making light bombers very fast. In some respects, they were looking for a very big fighter bomber. The aim was to dispense with the need for escort by being able to outrun enemy interception. With the ability to be able to fly slightly more than 300 miles an hour, they were close to achieving that aim. But fighter development overtook them. During their career, they were to become progressively slower as more weight was added onto them. The original fine design idea was lost in the demands of actual combat. The Mitchells and Marauders were both very good aircraft and tended to overshadow the smaller attack types. The Douglas Company had produced the A-20 Havoc, which performed reasonably well, both in Europe and in the Pacific. The French had been the first buyer for this Jack Northrop-designed aircraft, and Douglas turned out several thousand for use with most of the Allied forces. Flat out, the A-20s were faster than the B-25s or the B-26s, but at shorter range and carried a lot smaller load. The British, who called the A-26 the Boston, were particularly attached to it. They flew many daring and famous raids over Europe with them, as did the Free French forces. In the lead-up to D-Day, Many low-level A-20 missions were flown with the planes skinning across the channel as they raced towards the target. The Havoc was a fine airplane, and in its own quiet way, it did a number of jobs very well. First flown in 1938, it embodied a lot of pre-war theory about air warfare. It bristled with six defensive machine guns and carried a small bomb mode for relatively limited distances. However, it was the first American combat plane to employ tricycle landing gear. Importantly, it also proved to be sufficiently adaptable to be changed. When war arrived, it was extensively reworked into a series of very useful aircraft. The Douglas engineers, working under the leadership of Edward Heinemann, had designed a replacement for the Havoc. This was not to be another reworking of the A-20 either, but a new aircraft. Drawing heavily on the early experience of the war, they were able to take pre-war ideas, extract what had proved true, add wartime experience, and come up with what worked best. The intermediate effect of the A-26 was to render all other Allied light bombers obsolete. 
The new attack plane from Douglas was capable of over 350 miles an hour with a 3,000-pound bomb load. The Mitchells and Marauders were more than 70 miles an hour slower, where the A-26 went on to greater loads at higher speeds, the pre-war designs became slower. War experience imposed demands that went beyond the expectation of peacetime designers. The Invader was one of the very few designs which were begun, approved, produced, and used during the war. But although it was successfully deployed, peace cut short its production at the war's end. Nearly 10,000 Mitchells had been built, but there were only 2,453 Invaders to come off the assembly line. The design team built three prototypes on one airframe. The main difference were in the nose. The Night Fighter A-26A was short-lived, but the other two were developed and produced. The A-26B was fitted with a solid nose with six machine guns in it, whereas the A-26C had a glazed nose for Obama Deer. The first flight took place on the 10th of July 1942, and the plane was accepted with very few modifications. Even before the remaining bugs had been ironed out, invaders were rushed into combat. The crews found them delightfully maneuverable and impressively fast. Visibility was not as good as with the A-20s because of the positioning of the engines, but the pilot had remarkably good vision to the front and above. The first unit equipped with invaders had been flying A-20s. This was the 416th Bomb Group. In October 1944, squadrons began retraining and over the next month, the entire unit changed over. The first group sortie with the A-26 took place on the 17th of November. The weather over Europe was lousy that day and the group had the distinction of being the only 9th Air Force unit to complete its mission. In the European theater, invaders flew over 11,000 sorties in the remaining six months of the war. Along with other attack and tactical bombing aircraft, they played a major part in making possible the success of invading armies below. The invasion and subsequent liberation of the continent relied on the close support of tactical planes at the front lines. But bombing behind the enemy lines crippled the German combat unit's ability to organize and concentrate. Tanks, which should have been rushed into the battlefield, had to make long detours around smashed bridges and under constant aerial harassment. Not only were heavy losses inflicted, but German troops arrived in combat already exhausted when they got there. There was no guarantee that they would receive enough fuel and ammunition to keep fighting. The destruction brought on their supply lines condemned their effectiveness. By February 1945, 9,000 aircraft were attacking the German transport system. In parallel, the strategic bombing forces were relentlessly pounding the German fuel and aviation industries. The concentration of attack on the vital German infrastructure produced results. The invaders' defensive armament consisted with two twin gun turrets, one above and one below the fuselage. These were remotely controlled. The upper turret, which could be pointed forward to add to the power of the invaders, streaking at 500 rounds per gun, the lower turret guns were supplied with 400 rounds each. Both were normally operated by rear gunner. 
The solid nose version six machine gun barrage was increased on later examples to eight. In addition, the planes could carry a number of machine guns and packs under the wings. With four of the twin gun packs, an invader could bring an 18 gun blast to bear in strafing. The crews also found that once they had released their bombs, the planes behaved like fighters. At some altitudes, the A-26 could actually turn inside the Messerschmitt 109. Additionally, the invader was actually faster than the enemy 109, and only kept a few mile an hour slower than the F and G models. Its heavy frontal firepower allowed the solid nose version in particular the serious option of tangling with enemy fighters. By the time the A-26s entered the conflict, the German air effort was on the decline. However, German fighters did combat with them, with results which were not guaranteed to favor the Nazis. Very few invaders were shot down in air-to-air -air combat. One A-26 flown by Major Myron L. Durkee was credited with the probable kill of a Messerschmitt 262 jet fighter on the 19th of February 1945. In other clashes with fighters, A-26 losses were matched by downed Germans. Delays in deploying invaders into combat were mainly due to the time needed for the retraining of crews and ground personnel. The only major problems with the plane were a weak nose gear which often collapsed, a cockpit hatch that was difficult to bail out of, and an overly complex cockpit layout. With these faults rectified, the invaders' combat deployment continued as fast as possible. Though the German air effort was waning due to fuel shortages and the destruction of much of the aircraft production industry, anti-aircraft barrages continued. Missions were flown against heavily defended targets, and flak accounted for most of the invaders lost in combat. In a short period of their deployment in Europe, 67 A-26s were lost, but they chalked up seven confirmed air-to-air -air kills and numerous probables. The invaders were initially powered by 2,000 horsepower Pratt & Whitney R2800 engines. With the addition of water injection, the engines developed more power and the top speed of the aircraft was pushed up from 355 miles an hour to 373. About half the invaders were produced with this upgraded power plant. Statistical analysis of the work of the various US light bombers in Europe all indicates strongly that the A-26 outperformed all other types. Of course, these statistics must be approached with some caution. The A-26 operated only at the end of the war, when the German fire defenses were crumbling. The fact that there were fewer A-26 losses per thousand sorties is perhaps unbalanced. However, the fact that the invaders brought more tonnage permission than the A-20, the B-25, and the B-26 is not as readily questioned. When many indicators, the figures similarly show the A-26 with an edge over those earlier designs. In size, the A-26 was very similar to the two white bombers. It fitted neatly between the Mitchell and Marauder. The Invader has a wingspan of 70 feet, was 50 feet long, and had an empty weight at around 22,000 pounds. The maximum takeoff weight ranged up to 37,000 pounds. The plane could carry a 4,000 pound bomb load up to 1,400 miles. A few were equipped with radar and painted black for night bombing. Some are also later re-equipped by the French as night fighters. But in the European theater, the majority operated in the design role as light attack bombers. In the Pacific, more use was made out of their powerful gunnery and close support of ground troops though the Pacific-based groups also made good use of their virtues as stable, heavily armored bomb platforms. <laughs>
However, the arena where they really made their mark and threw their worth was Europe. An important factor in the success of the design was the structure of the wings. They were given a new low-drag laminar flow airfoil. The use of the cord-wise stiffeners gave the wings more strength, allowing it to carry the great loads of Anderslund stores that rounded off the invaders' operational force. The design incorporated a good deal of sophisticated engineering. It was originally almost unique in its square shape. Unlike the cylindrical monocoque form, the invader's structure relied on materials rather than shape. The strength of the invader's design, combined with its limited combat record, ensued continuation of this type when other wartime contemporaries disappeared. After the war, the A-26 remained in service, and efforts were even taken to turn it into a three-engine aircraft by installing a jet engine in the fuselage. A prototype was tested on June of 1946, reached a top speed of 413 miles an hour. The prototype was the only sample of the Invader built after VJ Day. The Invaders were evidently retained in the Air Force inventory as a stopgap measure until serviceable jet-powered bombers could be developed and deployed but they were to become much more than a stopgap when the Korean War began. Despite the distance from major jet-capable airfields in Japan, the war in Korea was essentially one of short distances and intense battlefield environments. As such, it was ideally suited to the invaders, which could operate from rough strips or make the trip from Japan with fuel to spare. They proved to be all-important in the assertion of air strength against the overpowering ground force advantage enjoyed by the communist forces. As bridges were destroyed and the UN forces withdrew in the initial onslaught of the invasion, the A-26s contained the attackers with constant raids, both with bomb runs and the withering fire from their mass machine guns. By now, they were called the B-26, having taken over the mantle of the marauders they had replaced. The creation of the U.S. Air Force had seen the doing away of the attack classification, and for convenience, the name change had been limited as much as possible. They were still the same mixture of glass-nosed C models and gun-nosed Bs, perceived as largely irrelevant pre-jet dinosaurs. They had not been noticeably re-equipped or upgraded, the invader continued to be classified as a plane. Those days were apparently numbered. There was only one factor which really kept them in inventory. They filled a niche no other plane could fill. In Korea, they rammed this message home with considerable force by being such an important part of the air power deploy. But the lessons they taught during the conflict were largely forgotten. And when Vietnam involved the U.S. 15 years later, the A-26 would still be needed. No suitable replacement had been developed. Korea was, however, the last major campaign where they operated in their originally designed role as a medium bomber. In Vietnam, this role would be the duty of other types, mostly fire bombers like the F-105 Thunder Chief. Korea set the stage for a change in the nature of geopolitics. With the technological defeat of the Chinese, the communists were reluctant to indulge in further head-on confrontations. Guerrilla activity would replace the normal battlefield. Evolving initially into a succession of localized revolts, even the Soviet Russia offered little assistance to this guerrilla activity. In Korea, the Soviets had withdrawn before the conflict began, and, in the course of the war, nothing had transpired to make them confront the USA. I never saw North Korea in the daylight, and so we thought we had the comfort of, of night, but of course you couldn't see the target very well either. Uh, everything would go smoothly until you started getting shot at, which was a frequent occurrence. And there's nothing like being at the receiving end of the 
lighted golf balls coming up searching you out in the sky at night and you find how maneuverable that airplane can be. The A-26, with its low level speed and powerful accurate armament, was recognized as the ideal counterinsurgency aircraft. Many of the revolutionaries in these campaigns were not communists but nationalists, poorly equipped and desperate for outside help. The development of guerrilla techniques required a new approach to conflict and new methods of counterinsurgency. Most of the developed military hardware was designed for combat with other military hardware of similar sophistication. No advanced design effort was going into combating basic primitive weapons, yet the threat being faced was largely at that level. The invaders offered many advantages in counterinsurgency work. They had a long range at speed, slow enough to allow close observation of an area. They also carried enough armor to be impervious to all but the luckiest riflemen. If they identified any guerrilla activity, it would generally be on such a small scale that a single invader could be largely assured of destroying it. Nothing had to be done to the A-26 to give it the offensive power, moderate speed, and long range for the job it had. Being a World War II aircraft, it had many relevant virtues. Producing jets to take its place was not a particularly glamorous role and nobody got around to do it for some time. Shortly after his inauguration, President Kennedy directed that counterinsurgency, an area of specific importance in U.S. military planning. He was almost too late. The A-26 was still available, but the airframes were approaching exhaustion. Events in Southeast Asia provided a counterinsurgency testing ground, and the invaders were deployed again. But the airframes soon began to crack up due to old age. Our airframes were rebuilt by the Mark Engineering Company into virtually new planes called the B-26K. On the outside, these were still invaders. But the modifications were extensive. The fuselage, as manufactured without the turrets, the wings were built and strengthened, the tail was enlarged, and the engines were replaced. They were needed in battle again, only this time, there was no battlefront, only jungle. The K had eight underwing hardpoints and could carry a powerful assortment of weaponry. Forty of these highly modified invaders were produced. Before the B-26K could be deployed, there was a small diplomatic protocol to be accommodated. The Thai government declined the opportunity to have bombers stationed at its airfields in operating against its neighbors. To accommodate their hosts, the United States Air Force redesignated the B-26K, the A-26A. As an attack plane, was not a bomber. Or so the story goes. Certainly, the planes that landed in Hawaii on their way to the Indo-Chinese jungles were once again A-26s. Whatever their designation, they were Douglas invaders. The first B-26 action in Vietnam had been way back on the 4th of November, 1950. The French Air Force had been the beneficiary of the Korean War. In that, the U.S., alarmed by the apparent spread of communism, spared 120 of its precious invaders to aid the French cause in Indochina. Invaders went on to support the legionnaires throughout the doomed occupation of Dien Bien Phu, which fell in 1954. 
The contracts for the B-26K, or the A-26A, were let almost exactly 10 years later. Perhaps the most important effect of the French use of the invaders was the defeat inflicted on the Viet Minh forces at Vinh Nhan. And with this frontline formation shattered by bombing and napalm raids, the North Vietnamese general, Vo Nguyen Diep, resolved to avoid any future set-piece battlefield wherever possible. Involvement of the United States and of the Douglas invader continued in Vietnam long after the departure of the exasperated and defeated French. There had been no such thing as the Vietnamese Air Force, so in 1951, the French created one. The most successful pilots became part of the retreating French forces, as did most of the aircraft. The Vietnamese Air Force establishment left by France was 28 nearly unserviceable Grumman Bearcats and an assortment of non-combat planes. When armed conflict resumed in 1959, it was the United States which responded to these Vietnamese needs. With continuing shortages of pilot and administrators, the VNAF was far from an effective force. To bolster it, American counterinsurgency units were transferred to South Vietnam in 1961. Because the U.S. was not involved in the war, these aircraft were flown with VNF mockings, officially there for training local air crews. The embargo on U.S. involvement in combat was artificially maintained by the presence on each flight of at least one Vietnamese personnel. In theory, no attack could be delivered unless it was authorized and directed by Vietnamese observers. In fact, even by December 1961, several attack missions had been flown without even the formality of the observer's presence. The B-26 aircraft in use had begun to fall apart under the strain when, in August 1963 and again in February 1964, wings fell off invaders in combat. The rest were grounded. Operations in Vietnam had to be transferred to ex-Navy Sky Raiders. It was not until the arrival of the rebuilt A-26As in June of 1966 that the invaders once again entered the Vietnamese combat. Operating from the Nakhon Phanom Air Force Base in Thailand, the invaders were flown on trial interdiction missions against the Vietnamese guerrilla supply lines by day and by night. Operating as part of a team with other types, they sought targets of opportunity. There was no specific target at a specific location to destroy, instead, there was a maze of jungle tracks to cover. The planes were flown by crews from the 606 and the 609th Air Commando Squadrons. Again, they brought to the counterinsurgency simpler virtues of a time long past and were far more appropriate to the task than Mach 2 fighters. Even the planes that had replaced them in the role as light bombers, the excellent B-57s lacked their ability to loiter at low speeds, waiting for a target to be identified. Operating over Laos and Cambodia in both parts of Vietnam, the invaders hit everything from troops to supply concentrations. Their speciality was truck busting in the Ho Chi Minh Trail under the call sign Nimrod. They dodged through the mountainous terrain to attack the North Vietnamese RD traffic. They were very effective, as they had been in Germany and Korea. The B-26Ks rebuilt by On Mark had upgraded engines and extended fuel storage. Including permanently fixed wingtip tanks, the rebuilt planes could deliver a load of over 6,000 pounds. This would typically consist of napalm, high explosive bombs, and fragment clusters. The machine guns carried 1,600 rounds apiece. The invaders had become even more potent weapons in their final form. The counterinsurgency methods built up across the invaders served as a model for future anti-guerrilla air warfare. Even after they were finally retired, 
they left a legacy of knowledge which continued to be important in Vietnam and has influenced actions elsewhere. This is particularly so with the methods developed for night interdiction. There's a part of this war that's uh, known to only a few. I'm talking about the night interdiction war. This war is being uh, fought at night in some rugged mountainous terrain any place in the world. The terrain and the weather and the night create an environment that is special and requires a special type of aircraft and a crew to be able to function in that environment. The candlestick mission is merely the lighting of a target for strike aircraft. Although it is usually true that the strike aircraft carry their own flares, it's very difficult for the pilot to compute wind, locate the target, and also keep his eye on the surrounding terrain. This is the purpose for the candle, which is the mission of the C-123 section. There are probably three basic reasons why the H-26 is used for our night missions against enemy supply vehicles. First reason is that the aircraft can carry a pretty respectful load of ordnance. The second reason is A-26 can remain in the target area for an effective period of time, which is something that jets don't generally do as a rule. The invaders continued their operations in Vietnam until late in 1969. By then, spare parts were getting scarce and attrition had again reduced the numbers available. The squadron stood down and the planes were ferried back to the United States. They were so few and they were so tired that they were not even considered mothballing. They were stripped of usable gear and scrapped. Even at the close of their career, it wasn't that the 26 wasn't still wanted. There were just none left to use. Very few military aircraft have been used to last like this or have served for so long. There are many things about this truly remarkable aircraft story that are quite unique. The Douglas Invader deserves its own glowing reputation.